when you think of electric vehicles or EVs, Tesla is probably the first name that pops into your head. And maybe Rivian or even Ford with its F-150 Lightning electric pickup truck that's been sold out everywhere. One name that's likely not on that list? Foxconn. The Taiwan-based tech giant is best known as the company that manufactures iPhones for Apple, along with dozens of popular electronic devices for other companies. Bloomberg's Reed Stevenson reports that now, Foxconn wants to do the same thing for EVs. The company is betting that many automakers won't want to deal with the complexity and expense of developing their own EV production lines. Instead, they'll hire Foxconn to build the cars for them. The company bought a sprawling former General Motors plant in Ohio, and it's refitting it to manufacture electric vehicles. Foxconn has the flexibility to say, look, we'll take your business, whichever sort of percentage of the car you need us to handle, and they'll proposition that they can do it faster and cheaper. I'm Wes Kosova. Today on The Big Take... Foxconn's leap from your pocket to your parking spot. Reed, we talk a lot about how electric cars are the future and every manufacturer wants to get in on it, just like Tesla. But they're having a hard time. Why has it been so difficult for legacy automakers to switch out combustion engines for electric ones? Combustion engines are the product of 100 plus years of technology. There are existing customers. There's a lot of investment that, you know, went into hybrids. And to ditch all of that, it's the classic innovator's dilemma, right? Do you kill your current customer base in order to transition to an entirely new set of customers? The economics are different. And so what you're finding with Ford and GM and Stellantis, you know, the transition is very tricky. It's going to take longer than uh, most people think. It's going to involve a lot of pain. And so what you're seeing this year, for example, is it's just going to happen in fits and starts. So Ford loses money on every F-150 Lightning electric pickup that they make. The company as a whole, its EV unit, is on track to lose $4.5 billion this year. That sort of leads you to the notion that starting from zero is the way to go. You can kind of look at Tesla as really an anomaly. You know, they kind of pulled off the impossible, which is going from a startup into a fairly largely scaled manufacturer that's purely focused on EVs. Obviously, BYD in China and NIO in China and other companies have also gone well along this path. And so when you look at it from both ends, from the startup end and then from the sort of legacy car maker end, coming from either end of those spectrums is just proving to be absolutely a nightmare for some. So every auto manufacturer wants to get into EVs because it's the future and yet really expensive to make, especially at scale. And into this picture you write comes Foxconn, the giant Taiwanese manufacturer. Can you remind us just what Foxconn is? So Foxconn makes two out of every three iPhones. They make the uh, Nintendo Switch, Ring doorbells, Sony PlayStation, Google Pixel. There's actually a pretty good chance that you're listening to this podcast on a device that was built in one of Foxconn's factories. And it's made its business essentially as a manufacturer for other name brands. It's not a brand unto itself. Instead, what it does, it it leverages massive scale and access to labor in China in order to build devices for essentially almost any major electronics manufacturer that you can think of. In fact, they're the world's third largest private employer after Amazon and Walmart with uh, 1.2 million employees spread across the world. And even within one factory in Shenzhen, China, they have have hundreds of thousands of people working in dozens of factories with restaurants, a bank, a fire station, power plant, hospital, all within a single facility that they use to make the iPhone and all these other gadgets. <laughs> 
And Reed, with this kind of capability to build all kinds of products, you write that a lot of these big name brand manufacturers years ago said, it's just not worth trying to manufacture this stuff ourselves. We'll just give it to Foxconn to do it for us. For all these gadgets, you know, initially many of these brands started to make them themselves close to home or or in the United States or elsewhere, and then realized that uh, outsourcing it made far more business sense. And so essentially, this is the argument that Foxconn wants to bring to the EV industry, that when you look at how these startups are struggling, how these legacy car makers are struggling, their proposition is, look, we'll build the EV for you. You can keep the brand name, you can keep all the flourishes that you would put on to it, but we can pull resources, we can access labor, we can build a deep and wide supply chain in order to make the economics of building and selling EVs work for essentially any customer. A customer can go to Foxconn and say, you know what, you build 90% of the car and we'll build 10% of it. The badge and the colors and maybe the interior design. Or they may say, you know what, we can build 60% of the car and we need Foxconn to build specific parts, maybe the suspension, maybe the powertrain. And Foxconn has the flexibility to say, look, we'll take your business, whichever sort of percentage of the car you need us to handle, and they'll proposition that they can do it faster and cheaper. And Reed, one of the things you write is the reason why Foxconn is able to do this is they not only manufacture things, but they have access to every kind of part you would need for a product all around the world. Exactly. So the other way to think of Foxconn is that it's also a supplier and not just an assembler. And so whether it's developing technology on its own, it's designing its own chips, it's designing components, it can build it, it can also go find it. And when you look at commonality across devices, it can start to uh, take advantage of scale so that motors or, or certain components might be found in multiple different vehicles just because they have access to it and they can offer it to those name brands much cheaper. So you could see why a struggling automaker looking to get into the EV market or even a startup would find this as an alternative to trying to do all this stuff themselves. But what's in it for Foxconn? Why would they want to take on this really big puzzle, which is completely different from what they're doing right now? So for Foxconn, what you're seeing is that their core business, smartphones and electronics and gadgets, were reaching a certain saturation point. Foxconn has gone out and tried to find ever bigger markets to break into, and EVs was one of them. You know, with the disruption in the transition to electric vehicles, they see an opportunity to kind of wedge themselves in there. And is the idea that because Foxconn is so huge, they need to take on big markets in order to even make a blip in their earnings? Exactly. They had $222 billion in revenue last year, and in order to really move that needle, The electric vehicle industry was an obvious target. Even at the current status of the industry, we're talking about $388 billion. And in addition to that, Foxconn is going to be looking at other areas such as robotics and digital health devices. So Reed Foxconn wants to move into making electric vehicles. And you write that one of the centers of this operation is actually in the U.S., Exactly. The big difference between making EVs and something like a smartphone is that you're going to have to produce them locally. There's transport costs. There's also local uh, tariffs and regulations and uh, subsidies that you can't tap into unless you build locally. Smartphones and gadgets and devices are much easier because most of them are hauled as air cargo around the world from those factories in China. And so Foxconn is going to be building EV factories around the world or buying them. The one that's being built is in Thailand right now, but the one that's actually sort of operational right now is in Lordstown, Ohio, in the eastern part of the state. And this is a factory that GM started in 1966. It made a bunch of Chevys over the years. And in 2019, GM was really seeing demand shrink for especially its compacts. Hybrid vehicles were really sort of the preferred choice for at least uh, smaller vehicles. Lordstown was identified as one of the plants that would be closed, and it went idle in 2019. 
There was a bit of a blip before Foxconn took over. Essentially, a startup called Lordstown Motors Corp came in, initially took the factory off of GM's hands. And then later on, another deal sort of ended up with Foxconn buying the factory from Lordstown Motors. Lordstown Motors went Chapter 11 earlier this year. So essentially, you know, Foxconn is the last remaining entity standing uh, in Lordstown. It owns the plant. It bought it for $230 million. And what it's essentially doing is it's preparing it for a future where they will be building EVs for a variety of manufacturers. After the break, a look inside Foxconn's Ohio factory. When I visited the plant, it's actually a multiple building spread across a huge swath of land right next to I-80 in Ohio. There's an assembly building, there's a metal stamping plant, there's a paint shop, but it's not really a shop, it's just a huge building onto itself. And what they're doing is they're essentially taking inventory. So in one building where they used to have robot arms, you know, welding parts together, all of those robot arms have now been removed off the line and set off and lined up on the side. They're assessing which ones might need repair, which ones uh, work fine. The metal stamping machines are also being inventoried in a similar manner. The assembly lines have kind of been stripped back to their basics. One of the people there told me that what they were creating was sort of like a supermarket of factory parts so that uh, whenever they did start to get orders for making vehicles, they could pull them out and start rebuilding the assembly lines for whatever the customers would need. And really, that's the big question here, is whether the business is going to come in the coming months or years. And who's working there right now? Who's taking this inventory and getting the factory ready for its next customers? Yeah, so the workers at the factory are mostly former GM workers. For a brief period, many of them worked for Lordstown Motors, and now they work for Foxconn. When I was there, they opened up a shop, actually, so that the employees could go and get Foxconn t-shirts and hoodies and baseball caps. And along with a bunch of Taiwanese employees, they're essentially preparing the factory, or at least keeping it sort of at a bare subsistence level, so that they can build EVs when that day comes. Now, this isn't Foxconn's first attempt to start a manufacturing plant in the U.S., You're absolutely right. In uh, Wisconsin, uh, just a few years earlier, the founder of the company, Terry Guo, who was still running it at the time, essentially he saw sort of a threat to his business model with the Trump administration coming in. Trump was keen to get factories back to the U.S., employ workers in the U.S. Otherwise, you know, the threat was that uh, he would impose tariffs on products that were built in China and elsewhere. So the idea by Terry Guo, Foxconn's founder, was to build electronics in Wisconsin. And so he started a factory there. In fact, it's still there. It actually employs even more people, about a thousand people. But it wasn't really clear from the get-go what the factory was going to build. Initially, the idea was flat panel televisions. Right now, it's doing some assembly of uh, servers. But the current CEO, Young Liu, who took over from Terry Guo in 2019, has essentially decided that the Wisconsin factory is going to become part of the supply chain for EV manufacturing in the U.S. and at Lordstown, and that it could possibly be used to build battery packs. So this factory in Lordstown aims to be far more ambitious, because you write that building EVs is many times more complicated than building even a device like the iPhone. Building an EV is somewhere between, I would say, building a smartphone and building a car. So if you imagine a smartphone has several hundred components, circuit boards, etc., a battery, uh, chips, it starts to resemble an EV, but an EV has many more components, 1,500 and above. But then when you look at it from the point of view of a fuel-burning engine car, you're looking at tens of thousands of components. You know, the engine alone has thousands. And so EVs essentially kind of sit in between that. And Foxconn's bet is that, well, look, it's going to be simpler than building a car. 
It's going to be uh, more complicated than building a smartphone, but we have decades of experience building a variety of devices, servers, computers, you know, Kindles, laptops, tablets. And so essentially an EV is just sort of a bigger version of that as far as Foxconn is concerned. Reed, you said that they're getting the factory all ready for future orders, but have they gotten any interest? Are any manufacturers coming to Foxconn and saying, please make our cars for us? The interesting thing is there is exactly one customer that is taking advantage of this factory in Lordstown. It's called Monarch Tractor. It's an electric tractor that can be operated remotely with a huge battery that lasts for about 14 hours. And if you think of the labor shortage that's going on in the U.S., especially in the agricultural industry, it's not a far-fetched idea to have electric tractors that can be operated remotely. You don't have any traffic concerns when you have a tractor going through you know, crop fields. And one person can actually operate several at the same time. And so this essentially became a perfect kind of test case for Foxconn to build a vehicle, electric vehicle, without a whole lot of risk. These tractors from Monarch cost about $89,000 each. They're fairly straightforward devices. It's all hand assembly at the moment because there's not a huge amount of volume. But what it does is it's a proof of concept. It's something to show other potential customers what Foxconn can do at the factory. Based on my conversations there, it seems that there's about 10 potential entities that are looking at building vehicles in Lordstown, and about five of them are in a fairly advanced negotiation stage. Foxconn hasn't told me which companies it's negotiating with. It could be startups or it could be legacy car makers. The one that is public knowledge is Fisker. They're looking to build a second car called the Pair, and they've publicly disclosed that they're in negotiations with Foxconn. But as far as I can tell, they haven't reached any final agreement yet. Reed, is there any indication of when this factory would be up and running? It's essentially up and running right now, just at a really, really minor scale. At full capacity, this factory, when it was churning out Chevys, could uh, make about 350,000 vehicles a year. Foxconn, with some expansion, there's some more land around the factory, could make 500,000 vehicles a year. But just to put that into perspective, Tesla made 1.4 million last year. But that's not necessarily the number that matters. It's essentially a factory for components as well. So even if a large number of vehicles aren't necessarily assembled there, the Lordstown factory can actually build components for other parts of its supply chain, or it could just make components for a uh, conventional automaker. In fact, one of the stories I heard there was that while they were getting this factory refurbished and ready to run again, they got an inquiry from one of the big three, I believe, to make door panels. And Foxconn being a fairly pragmatic company, I think took the proposal seriously because, well, you know, door panels, door panel, and if somebody wants to buy them, they'll make them. Are they actually starting to hire people for the future? How many people will work this plant once it's at full capacity? So at the moment, the factory in Lordstown has about 400 people. That's probably more than they need at the moment. I think when the factory was at full capacity and, and running multiple shifts, there were about 1,600 people there. So that's potentially as large as it might get, at least for a capacity of around, you know, 350,000 vehicles. Beyond that, you know, it, it could actually go into multiple thousands of people. But that's just all going to depend on, you know, how much business they get. When we come back, Reed pays a visit to Foxconn's CEO. Read the Lordstown factory that's under development is just one of several manufacturing facilities that Foxconn plans to build for this big EV push. Is that right? Yeah. So the factory in Lordstown is one that they bought. It's essentially turnkey with a little bit of elbow grease and work. But in Thailand, they're taking an entirely different approach. They uh, hooked up with a, a state investment entity. And just outside Bangkok, they're building uh, an EV factory from scratch. 
The goal there is within a few years to be able to churn out about 150,000 EVs. And then down the road, they're looking at potentially opening an EV facility in India and then ultimately in uh, Europe, where they also have quite a large manufacturing presence. And Reed, when you were reporting this story, you went and spoke with Foxconn's CEO. What did he tell you about this big push to steer the company toward EVs? Yeah, so Young Liu, who joined Foxconn in 2007, took over from the founder in 2019. He's got, I think, a monumentally complex job, you know, managing 1.2 million employees. He's got to keep the existing smartphone manufacturing and, and electronics device business going. And then the EV project is his project. He initiated it after taking over. So he's keeping a pretty close eye on it. To learn a little bit about Foxconn itself and its corporate culture, you know, I went to visit its headquarters and spend some time with Chairman and CEO Young Liu in uh, Tu Cheng, which is this suburb of Taipei. It's full of factories and the building is unassuming. It's a five-story building. As I sort of made my way around the ground floor, you turn a corner and and you come across a small factory. You know, behind these sort of soundproof doors, you have uh, stamping machines that are uncoiling uh, thin copper tape, stamping out connectors or, or components for circuit boards. And, you know, the factory was there since day one when it was built probably 40, 40 plus years ago. I asked people there, you know, why is there a factory here? Most companies would have moved it out a long time ago. And, you know, all I got was essentially a verbal shrug. They were like, well, it's there because it's always been there. If you think of the culture of this company, it costs money to move a factory and you don't get the components while the factory is being moved. You lose efficiency, at least for a while. So there's no reason to get rid of the factory. So there it stays. The interesting thing was it was kind of across the hall from the cafeteria. So as you're kind of walking through that floor at lunchtime, you you get sort of the smell of braised pork belly and, and, and Taiwanese food mixed in with like lubricating oil for the stamping machines. So spending time with the CEO, Young Liu, I uh, saw him sit in in a couple meetings and it was really interesting because he wasn't working in an office. What he was working out of was a conference room, a huge desk with a huge screen in front. But what he had kind of arrayed around him were products from his most important customer, Apple. So there was a, a MacBook, two iPads. He had uh, an Apple Watch on his wrist and he had an iPhone on his hand. And, you know, he's sort of using all of these devices as he's in the call. Every now and then he would sort of tap an unmute button on his iPad and talk to a couple of secretaries and assistants that were on the call, essentially giving them items to follow up on or or things to look up or, or things to take care of while he was in the call. And so I got the impression that, you know, he really doesn't sort of waste a lot of time typing out emails. What he was doing was sort of absorbing information and then acting on it in real time. That's probably what his entire day is like. What he told me was that he only really starts typing messages when he gets home. And what did he have to say about Foxconn's future? Where does he want to take this company? So the strategy that Young Liu came up with is what he calls three plus three. And EVs, uh, robotics, and digital health devices make up the first three. And then the technology behind the second three is going to be uh, semiconductors, telecommunications, and artificial intelligence. And so what he's really trying to do is break into three kind of nascent markets and uh, develop the technology to do so. The methodology is to divide and conquer. We divide EV into different subsystems. And then for the ones that we are familiar with, then we you know, move on to that quickly. But for the ones that we were not familiar with, you know, we either go invest or go acquire from the outside. It's not just going to be about offering to assemble all of these gadgets for other entities. What he also wants to do is become the supplier and, and build all the components that are going to be necessary to essentially capture market share in these three large markets. And Reed, there's been a lot of speculation that Foxconn, which makes Apple devices, 
now moving into electric vehicles might mean that Apple's long-rumored push to make an electric vehicle will be a Foxconn venture. Yeah, so the sort of unspoken subtext to all of this is that, you know, Apple has been working on a car, uh, a project that isn't so much of a secret anymore for the better part of a decade. They're still working on it, but the time frame is not clear. Our best guess at the moment, based on reporting by Bloomberg News, is that an Apple car could debut by the end of the decade. And so another way to look at all of Foxconn's efforts here is that it's it's sort of ramping up expertise and volume and, and facilities should the day come when Apple goes looking for a manufacturing partner for EVs that Foxconn will be ready because it has the long history with the company and it has built up the uh, capacity to uh, deliver the EVs that Apple's going to want to design and sell. And what did Foxconn say about that? Did you ask them? Foxconn, it's hard to get them to talk about any of their customers, but especially hard to get them to talk about Apple. They are arguably Apple's most important partner, and Apple is arguably their most important customer. It's a relationship that they don't want to damage. And so any conversation about any upcoming Apple product, whether it's an iPhone or an Apple Watch or an EV, it's going to be a very short conversation. Reed, thanks so much for taking us inside Foxconn. Thank you. It was a lot of fun to report. Thanks for listening to us here at The Big Take. It's a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. For more shows from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us questions or comments to bigtake at bloomberg.net. The supervising producer of The Big Take is Vicki Vergolina. Our senior producer is Catherine Fink. Our producers are Michael Falero and Mo Barrow. Rafael M. Seeley is our engineer. Our original music was composed by Leo Sidrin. I'm Wes Kosova. We'll be back tomorrow with another Big Take.